Stories Live, We Do Wednesday. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Elizabeth Kamins, <clears throat> 3GNY president and grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. This is our 26th We Do Wednesday, our virtual series that brings our educational initiative, We Do, from classrooms to living rooms. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. For tonight's event, we'll be featuring 3GNY volunteer, Bella Brandeis, who will share the story of her grandfather, Otto Brandeis. Bella has been involved with 3GNY for several years and has continually volunteered in a variety of capacities over that time. She is part of our marketing committee and is a familiar, helpful, and kind face at many of 3GNY's events. Bella is a frequent speaker in schools through our WeDo program and does an incredible job sharing her grandfather Otto's story. Tonight's program showcases 3GNY's flagship educational initiative, WeDo, which is short for We Educate. WeDo is a four-week training program that empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their families Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. Education is more important and more urgent than ever. Given the horrifying rise of anti-Semitism we see in the headlines on a daily basis, we know we need to keep doing that work as much as we possibly can. Studies have shown that students who receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They're more willing to challenge incorrect or biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. Through our grandparents' testimony, we talk about the importance of stepping in early and often where small injustices are found, on the playground, in the classroom, and on the street, because it is the easiest and most efficient way to act. By the time the Nazi tanks roll in, it is too late. 3GNY has trained more than 400 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and around the country. We've spoken in more than 800 classrooms and have impacted more than 40,000 students and community members. And between our live programming and YouTube channel, more than 18,000 additional people have heard our stories. Hope is not lost and we need to keep doing the work now more than ever. You can help us accomplish this through a financial gift. This will go directly towards training more speakers, thus reaching even more students. We do not solicit donations from schools, teachers, or students. We provide our programming to schools completely free, and we aim to keep the cost of training to 3Gs as low as possible. There is a link with ways to donate in the chat, and we hope you'll consider making a gift. If you've already donated to us, thank you so much. You can sponsor an event or program in honor or in memory of a survivor or loved one, and there are also corporate sponsorships that you can partake in. Thank you again for being here tonight. You're helping us to honor the memories of our grandparents and ensuring that never again is more than just an empty phrase. I'd now like to call on Lauren Jacobs, a 3GNY volunteer, who will introduce herself and Bella. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Jacobs, grandchild of Betty Burlad, a Holocaust survivor from Vienna, Austria. It has been such an honor to be part of WeDo, from the community to the curriculum, to get to share my grandmother's story and promote Holocaust education and awareness. It is now my pleasure to introduce, to introduce Bella Brandeis. She completed three GNYs WeDo training in 2021 as a way to honor her grandfather and keep his memory alive by sharing his story in classrooms. She feels fortunate that his recorded testimony is part of USC's Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, and Bella references his storytelling directly as she carries on his legacy. She is currently working to piece together her grandmother's story. Bella grew up in Boston, but has called New York City home for the past 12 years. She works in advertising sales as an account director for a premium streaming service. Bella's light shines brightly in all of the contexts mentioned above, from the WeDo organization to her work in advertising and in the many lives she touches here in this community and beyond. 
Tonight is no exception. Bella, take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I really appreciate those kind words, and I'm so excited to be here tonight. Thank you, Elizabeth Caymans, Dave Breckis, Gail Peck, and everyone else at 3G for all of your support and for helping me find the tools and courage to share my family's story, both for students in schools and with everyone tonight. I'm really honored to be part of this amazing community. As mentioned, I'm the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors, and tonight I will share the story of my paternal grandfather, Otto Brandeis. My grandfather did not talk much about his life before or during the war, at least not when I was around. I always knew that he survived the Holocaust, was a survivor of Auschwitz, but a big regret is that I never was able to ask him to share his story. He passed away 10 years ago, but I'm so fortunate that he recorded his story as part of the Shoah Foundation testimonies and also recorded a five hour audio interview. And using these as resources, I was able to listen and find answers to questions I was never able to ask him. Now, when I speak in schools, I always like to start by engaging in conversation with students. I'll ask if they've heard from a survivor and what that experience was like, or if they're familiar with the terms ghettos and concentration camps, so I know how much detail I have to go into, or I simply just ask how they would describe their grandparents. And then I pull up this picture and I start to describe my grandfather, who I called Zadie, which is Yiddish for grandfather. My grandfather was one of the best people I knew. He was caring, devoted to his family, and my sisters and I were the light of his life, and he would smile every time we walked into the room. He was fiercely proud of his family's accomplishments and so excited to tell people that his granddaughters were college educated and worked in New York City. We spent many holidays together, both in Florida and the Catskill Mountains, and he was just so happy to have his family around him. I'm so fortunate that he spent the last years of his life in Boston, so we were able to get together frequently. He had an amazing memory up until the end of his life. I don't think there was anything he ever forgot. That five hour audio interview that I mentioned, he did when he was in his 90s, and he can still recall the name of the street he grew up on in Poland. I also learned at a young age, he was a Holocaust survivor imprisoned by the Nazis, his only crime being Jewish. But before I get into his story of the Holocaust, I want to tell you a little bit more about my grandfather's life before the war. Now, we don't have any photos of my grandfather before the war because everything was taken away um, when the Nazis invaded Poland. But we do know that Otto Brandes was born in Lodz, Poland in 1911 and grew up in Pavanitz, a small town 12 miles south of Lodz. He was the oldest of five children, three boys and two girls, but one sister died as a baby. His father owned a textile factory where he and his brothers worked after school and his mother was a homemaker. They had a small house with a well and an outhouse in the backyard, and he always used to joke that even in the good old days, it wasn't always good when you had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night in winter in southern Poland. My grandfather came from an observant Jewish family, and they went to synagogue every week. He does recall some anti-Semitism growing up, but the family pretty much stayed within their own Jewish community, and he did have to drop out of school as a teenager because his family could no longer pay the tuition to the Hebrew school that he went to. So he went to work in the family factory as a weaver full-time. In 1931, at age 20, he joined the Polish army and he served for 15 months. Upon completion of his service, he returned home to once again work in the family factory. And this is where he was living when World War II broke out. My grandfather was 28 years old in 1939 when the Nazis invaded Poland and the persecution of the Jews in his town began. All the Jews in town had to register and were forced to wear yellow armbands with the word Jude, German for Jew on them, so that they could be easily identified. My grandfather did not wear the armband, he risked being shot. Jewish stores were marked or taken away, including his family's factory. A curfew was introduced and Jews were forbidden from moving or leaving town. 
Shortly after, the Jews were forced to move into a newly created Jewish ghetto a few blocks on the outskirts of town. And by this time, my grandfather's mother had died, one brother had fled Poland, so my grandfather, his father Herschel, his sister Sophie, and brother Max were forced to leave their house and move into a single room that they shared in the ghetto. Now, my grandfather was sent to work in another factory, and his ability to work would prove to be very helpful throughout the war because when the Nazis um, invaded and took over, they used slave labor as part of their war efforts. One day, he found that his youngest brother, Max, did not return from the factory where he worked. Sometimes boys would just disappear off the streets. And my grandfather didn't know what happened and wouldn't find out until many years later. And there are two stories I always like to share with the students about my grandfather's time in the Pavanitz ghetto. The first is that while he was in the ghetto, his father, Herschel, became sick. So my grandfather naively thought it would be safest to put him in the hospital in the ghetto so he could be watched by doctors while my grandfather would work during the day. However, when the Nazis liquidated the ghetto, the sick and elderly were the first to be taken away. The Nazis forbid my grandfather to go to the hospital and to say goodbye, so he had to watch from the street corner as his father was loaded onto a truck and taken away to be killed. The other story is that one day Nazi soldiers were going from house to house looking for Jews. Um, my grandfather didn't have time to properly escape or hide, so he just threw dirty clothes on the ground, created a mess, and hid behind the door. And when the Nazis got to his room, they looked around, but they didn't enter because they saw it was dirty. And presumably, they were scared that they were going to catch a disease from the dirty Jews. So they just left and moved on to the next house, not noticing that my grandfather was hiding right behind the door. It was these little bits of luck that my grandfather says helped keep him alive throughout the war. Three years after the war began, in 1942, the Nazis forced all of the Jews in Pavanitz to report to a local soccer stadium. Some, mostly children and elderly, were put to one group and sent to one side and taken to death camps. My grandfather and his sister Sophie were sent to the other side. Fortunately, they were both selected to work and moved to a larger ghetto in nearby Ludge. And now I'll share a clip of my grandfather speaking about a memory from that day. And I just ask that you make sure the volume is turned up on your computer so you can hear. I saw when we were standing in the line, you know, to, so they were standing, uh, I remember him. He had a little boy, five, six years, seven years old. He was running, he was running between his legs, between our, between our line and in the, so a German uh, police or a soldier, whatever, whoever knows, he had a cane with, with this handle, you know, around. He grabbed him by his neck and he tore them away. Ah. So when my grandfather and his sister Sophie arrived at the Ludge Ghetto, he arrived to a much larger ghetto than where he had just come from. The Pabinitz Ghetto was small and in a part of town that the Nazis forced the Jews to live in just a few streets on the outskirts. But the Ludge Ghetto was massive, right in the middle of the city with two sides connected by a footbridge and it was overcrowded with people. My grandfather explained that there was a footbridge with two huge sides and people everywhere and there was barbed wire all around and watchtowers with armed Nazi guards. He remembers a horrible stench anytime he went outside and as he looked around he would see people lying in the streets close to death from disease or starvation. When he arrived in the Ledge Ghetto, he went to a church to pick up some blankets and pillowcases. And in one of the pillowcases, he happened to find a few jewels. He had no idea where they came from. Maybe they were accidentally, accidentally left there, or maybe somebody had put them there on purpose to help the Jews. But either way, he was able to sell them and get some money and therefore get some extra food for him and his sister. Again, he says this is just an instance of luck that helped him to survive another day. My grandfather worked in numerous factories for the next two years in Ledge. Um, as I told you, the, his ability to work could help keep him alive. And then he worked until the Nazis began to liquidate the ghettos and send the remaining prisoners to concentration camps. When the roundups began, my grandfather would hide at first so he would not be sent away. But eventually he felt that there was nowhere else to hide. 
My grandfather and his sister, Sophie, were taken in one of the roundups, taken to the train station and loaded onto a cattle car. There were around 100 people in his cattle car piled on top of each other, no windows for fresh air and no food, no water, no toilets. People started scratching and, um, you know, scratching out the floor and digging holes in the ground in the train in order to relieve themselves. And he was being taken to Auschwitz. And now I'll let my grandfather explain his arrival in Auschwitz in his own words. Yes, they, they took us straight to a, a like like a, a big a big spot arena, like a big you know, we were standing there and first they took the the uh, woman out in in and they took my sister too. And then uh, an hour, two hours later we were still standing there on the they told us to throw the rings, the the, the, the watches, everything, and, and, and you know that they put together. My sister, they took my sister. When my sister came out, she was already no hair. She was wearing already a schmatter over her, or, you know, for my sake, for her sake, yeah. and crying. You know. I didn't see her anymore. I still get chills every time I listen to that story and think about the last time my grandfather saw his beloved, his beloved sister. I now take some time and I explain to the students that Auschwitz was the most notorious of all the concentration camps with its purpose to efficiently kill as many people as possible. Upon his arrival, he was stripped of his clothes, his head was shaved, he was given rags to wear and assigned to his barracks. Now, most Jews who were imprisoned in Auschwitz had numbers tattooed on their arms in an effort to replace their identities, but my grandfather did not. And when I asked him why, he explained that by the time he arrived in Auschwitz, the Nazis were no longer keeping track of their victims. The number of Jews arriving each day was too many and it was a race against the clock for the Nazis to kill as many Jews as possible. While he was in prison in Auschwitz, my grandfather found out that the Nazis would need plumbers. He knew that Auschwitz was not a place he wanted to stay and that the ability to work could help keep him alive a little bit longer. Um, and since he had worked in many factories in his life, he figured that he could apply his skills to plumbing. So he registered himself as a plumber. He knew the penalty for lying was death, but he was willing to take the risk and it paid off a few days later, he managed to get placed on a transport out of Auschwitz. My grandfather was now 34 years old when he arrived in Friedland Labor Camp, which was a subcamp of Gross Rosen on the Polish and Czechoslovakian border. I'm always certain to tell the students that even though this was a smaller camp and there were no gas chambers, he was still very much a prisoner, used for slave labor, and imprisoned only because he was a Jew. He was still forced to sleep in overcrowded barracks, had minimal food, and was in constant fear of Nazi brutality. I also show this photo and tell them, well, this isn't a picture of my grandfather. It shows Jewish prisoners being forced to walk to work, and you can see that there's snow on the ground. My grandfather had to work in all weather conditions. Now, Southern Poland has extremely harsh winters, full of snow and average temperatures only reached a high of 32 degrees. But the prisoners were still forced to walk to work in just wooden shoes and prison uniforms, which were rags no heavier than pajamas. He was forced to work in an airplane propeller factory. He would work 12 hour shifts, seven days a week, with only a small bowl of soup for dinner and stale bread each day for breakfast. And this is where he was imprisoned until the end of the war. He was liberated in May 1945 by the Russian army. And when he woke up one day, he found that the camp was dark and the Nazis had abandoned the watchtowers. The Nazis knew that the Russian army was nearby and they wanted to save themselves. So they locked the prisoners in the camp and they fled. 
Um, my grandfather, along with other prisoners, cut holes in the barbed wire and escaped to a nearby hill in the woods. All night, he heard shooting and singing, and when the sun came up, he saw the Russian army at the camp. He saw that there was the Russian army at the camp, not the Nazis, so he felt that it was safe to come out of the woods. When he returned to camp, he was told that he was free and could go, but he didn't know where to go or what to do or what it meant to suddenly be free. He was in an unfamiliar city. He ended up in a hospital in nearby Prague, and when he was healthy enough to travel, he returned to his hometown in Poland to see if anything or anybody was left. But when he returned, he found no family, no friends, no one he cared about or who cared about him. He found out that his youngest brother, Max, the one who had disappeared years before, had survived and was in Germany. So my grandfather hitchhiked to Munich and reunite with, reunited with his brother. They lived in a displaced persons camp run by the American army, and they lived there with other survivors of the war, both Jews and non-Jews, anyone who had been imprisoned and displaced by the Nazis. He joined a Jewish center in Munich, which helped provide food, clothes, and some work, and slowly but surely, him and his brother started to rebuild their life. While in Germany, he found out that his other brother, one who had fled Poland before the war, was also alive, and he came to Germany also. So the three of them were reunited and lived in Munich for four years. And he lived there until he was able to receive a visa to come to the U.S. where he had some family. My grandfather came first, and a few weeks later, his brothers followed. At 38 years old, in 1939, 10 years after the war began, my grandfather arrived in the United States and stayed with family in New Jersey until he could afford a place of his own. He didn't speak any English, but was a hard worker and eventually learned the language. His first job was in a slipper factory in New Jersey, and then he moved to a textile factory in Queens. And eventually, him and his brothers were able to start their own textile factory, Brandeis Brothers Textile Mills, like their father had in Poland. And at night, he would get together with other survivors, and one night he met a Polish girl who had also survived the Holocaust. She was living in Montreal, but in New Jersey, visiting a friend. A few weeks later, my grandfather went to visit her in Canada, and after eight days, they were married. That girl was my grandmother, Bella, who I'm named after, and you can see their wedding photo here. They were married for 34 years up until her death, and they were able to build a beautiful life together, and most importantly, proudly and openly practiced their Judaism. They had one son, my dad, and three granddaughters, and I'm so proud to be here today to carry on their traditions and share their stories. Here are some pictures of my grandfather with my family, and this is the way I remember him, smiling, happy, and proud. And we'll never know why my grandfather survived the Holocaust when so many innocent lives were lost. In the interviews, when he was asked this question, he simply would say it was because he had luck. My grandfather was a resilient man who showed nothing but love and compassion for his family and people around him. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind. He was serious, but also could be funny and made it a point to be present at school events or birthdays whenever he could. Spending time with his family was everything, and so was passing down the Jewish traditions to his grandchildren. And as I was listening to his recordings over the past year, I learned that he had nightmares into his old age that I would have never known. He never showed any hatred or anger towards the world. He was so determined to not let his past define him. And my hope is that when I speak to students and I share the story, that they hear it and they understand the dangers of spreading hatred. And over the past several weeks, we've seen a terrifying rise in anti-Semitism around the world. And it's a very painful reminder that there's a lot of work to do. And so with that, I wanna thank you for listening to this little part of Auto Story tonight. Bella, thank you so much for gifting us with your family story. You did a beautiful job retelling the story of your grandfather, Otto. We're now going to open it up for questions. If you have a question for Bella, please type it in the question and answer box in the Zoom uh, page, and we'll do our best to address it. If we don't get to your question, 
please feel free to email us at info at 3gnewyork.org and we will absolutely get back to you later on. Bella, one of the questions that we received from a viewer tonight was what DP camp did your grandfather Otto live in? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I'm not sure the name of it. He may have mentioned it, but I didn't write it down. Um, but I do know it was in Munich and his brother had survived Dachau concentration camp. So I think it was somewhere around there. Bella, another one of our viewers wants to know, are there any times of the day or specific routines in your daily life that particularly remind you of your grandfather? Um, it's funny, but actually when I'm with my father, his son, um, I see a lot of similarities and it just always makes me happy um, when I'm with my family. I also know that my grandfather would be so proud to you know, see his family thriving and growing. Do you know your grandmother's story of survival during the Holocaust? So I know bits and pieces of it. That's something I'm actually working on now. It's a little trickier because she unfortunately passed away in the 80s. And that was before Spielberg um, recorded testimonies and before a lot of survivors really spoke about their experiences. So I know bits and pieces, but I actually recently found out that what I thought I knew wasn't actually where like the camp I thought she was in wasn't actually where she was. So I am still working on that. Um, I've actually reached out to Bergen Belsen concentration camp and some other groups in Germany to try to help me place her story. Someone else would like to know if your grandfather ever went back to Poland after the war and would you ever go see his hometown and where your family came from? I don't believe he ever went back to Poland. Not that I'm aware of. Um, definitely not while I was around. I've thought about it. It is something I want to do. I've been to Germany and I've seen concentration camps because I do think it's important to visit there. I would like to go to Poland to visit where my grandfather was from and to see Auschwitz. But I can also tell you that when he was alive, he did not want us to go. He encouraged us to travel, but he felt that there were a lot of other places we could go and spend our time. And he didn't see why we wanted to go back to Poland when there was nothing there anymore for him. Another question we received was whether you ever tried to speak with your grandfather about his experience. Um, and did your dad ever talk with him about his Holocaust experiences? I I didn't try. Um, I was younger. He was my grandfather. He was always asking about me and my life. And um, I was young and I, I didn't ask. And it's something, as I said, I wish I did. As I got a little bit older and he neared the end of his life, he would mention things here or there. Um, he said something about the last time he saw his sister to me once, but I didn't press him. Um, I think I was a little uncomfortable, to be honest, to ask him. And I think my dad has spoken to him about it. My dad help me kind of fill in some of the blanks as well. One of the other participants would like to know, uh, do you know how it was that the brothers were actually able to find one another? I my grandfather says that when he was in, he went back to Poland after he was liberated um, and he was kind of looking around for family friends and he was there and he said one day a man showed up and asked if he was Otto Brandeis. The sense I got in from my research is people kind of through other people and other survivors and as people were traveling around they would you know, mention names and ask around to see if they could find people. So somebody just showed up and asked if he was Otto Brandeis. And he said yes. And they told him that his brother Max was alive and living in Germany. Um, I'm not sure how he found his other brother, Henry. I don't really know much about that story either. And he didn't see in his recordings. He just kind of said he found out his brother was alive and they met up, is, is what he said. 
Relating to that, how did your grandfather feel about living in Germany after the war? And did he ever speak about that time or his experience living in Germany? He didn't really, um, at least not to me. And in his recordings, he's kind of very vaguely mentioned the time he was living in Germany and the DP camp. Um, he knew he wanted to come to the United States. He had an uncle and an aunt here. Um, so he knew this is where he wanted to go. He actually said that at one point he had the opportunity to go to Israel, um, but he he held fast that he wanted to come to the United States. I did actually go back recently and re-listen to the tapes. And he mentioned a little bit more about the DP camp, but in Germany, but he didn't give many details. He just said they kind of waited and waited, and it was a lot of waiting around and um, until you know he could get the visa to come. Another question that's been asked a couple of times is when you speak to the classrooms, what are some of the questions that students ask you? Yeah, so it, it varies. Um, I've spoken to a handful of classrooms from sixth graders up to 10th graders. I actually spoke to 10th graders yesterday um, and I get a variety of questions. A lot of them are kind of are questions about the war um, itself and less about my grandfather. A lot of the students have, you know, just started a Holocaust education in their classrooms or some of them haven't even gotten to that unit yet. So they're asking who was at war against the Nazis? What happened to all of the Nazis? Um, so I have a lot of kind of questions and I feel like we talk a lot about history and the, the teacher then gets involved and it's a nice conversation. Occasionally I'll get questions about my specific grandfather and to be honest, they're similar to these questions tonight. They ask about my grandmother, they ask about his brother's story. Um, they ask if he was angry. Um, if he was ever able to forgive the Nazis. So I've gotten a wide range of questions, but I love talking to the students and I love, I really try to keep my con my presentation short because a lot of times I only have 10, 15 minutes, you know, the classes are 40 minutes and I like to keep the presentation very short so that we can have a conversation and open it up to discussion because I think that's how it'll really resonate with the students as opposed to just me talking to them. What types of resources have assisted you in understanding and learning more about your grandfather's story? Yeah, um, like I said, I'm very fortunate. He did a lot of recordings. The Shoah testimony is probably around four hours of um, video. And this other recording he did was five hours of him just talking and for his story, I really didn't need much more. I did have to do a little bit of, you know, Googling and I used the Museum of Jewish Heritage and um, the Holocaust Museum in DC and Yad Vashem has a lot of resources. So I was able to kind of tap into questions I didn't know. Um, an example is the, this like when my grandfather talks about him being liberated in his recordings, he says, you know, the camp was dark. He woke up one morning and the camp was dark, but he never kind of explained what that meant. I did some research about Friedland labor camp and I read some, you know, listened to some other people's testimonies. And I actually found out through some research that on May 8th, two days before he was liberated, as the Russians were getting close, they bombed an energy plant um, nearby. And that's what caused the electricity to go out in the camp. Um, so again, it's just a lot of research and reading testimonies and articles and using the um, Holocaust Museum's resources. Do you think your grandfather's positivity and the fact that he didn't express hatred were skills that contributed to his ultimate survival? Sorry, can you say that one again? <laughs> sure. Do you think your grandfather's positivity and the fact that he didn't express hatred himself were skills that ultimately contributed to his survival? Ooh, good question. I do. My grandfather, well, when he was already older, when the war began, so I think he, um, he kind of was aware of what was going on and how he tried different behaviors that could help him potentially survive, even though nothing, you know, could save certain people and there was just nothing you could do. But like I said, he was almost, he was in his 30s, so he was kind of able to keep quiet when he needed to. Um, 
but yeah, I think his positive strength and energy really kept him going and just knowing that he had to get by one more day, um, that he would survive. So yeah, I absolutely do. How has your work as a 3G affected your relationship with your father, who is a 2G? Um, it's been great. I've loved doing this presentation for him. Um, he's heard it a few times and he was really able to kind of help me fill in the gaps. And it opened, it also opened lines of conversation that we, we haven't had before. We didn't, like I said, we always talked about the Holocaust. It was very open in my family. You know, my grandparents were survivors. A lot of people we knew had grandparents and parents who were survivors. Um, but we never really talked specifically in detail about you know, what happened to my grandfather. And also we never really talked about his life before the war. I don't know if we really knew some stuff before I listened um, and watched the videos. Here's an interesting question. If you've ever had any students who said that their parents told them that the Holocaust is a bunch of lies, how have you dealt with them? I haven't. Um, I've had students who when I spoke was the first time they've ever heard about the Holocaust. Um, but I've act, I fortunately have never had an experience um, where a student has, you know, pushed back or shared sentiments like this. I don't know if you, Lauren, or you, Elizabeth, have ever had that experience, but I have not. I guess kind of similarly to that, but not quite. How has your experience had, as a 3G impacted your interaction with Germans, if you've had any of today's generation? Ooh, um, you know, it doesn't. It, our grandparents were grandparents, and I, you know, I think everybody um, that I've encountered that are Germans and non-Germans, you know, understand the Holocaust and the atrocities and, you um, you know, really want to learn and understand what happened so we can all make sure that it never happens again. Um, I was in Berlin with my mom a few years ago and everyone I encountered was super friendly, very nice. Um, I remember we had one tour guide actually when we went to Sachshausen concentration camp and she was so interested when she found out that I was a grandchild of survivors. She, you know, encouraged conversation and dialogue and wanted to hear my story, my grandfather's story. We also had, when I was in high school, a German student stay with us for some time. Again, because she came, because she wanted to meet my grandfather and hear his story and learn about the history. So I, I've, everyone I know has just wanted to educate themselves. How did your grandfather's experience affect his faith and his belief in God? And over the subsequent years, did he ever manage to regain or hold on to his belief in God? I think so. Um, again, I never had this conversation, but he was religious, observant, believed in Judaism, openly practices Judaism. This was something that was very important for him to pass down to his family. Um, so I have to think that throughout the whole time, he, he maintained that relationship with God and his faith and his Judaism. What does it mean to be a 3G to you? And why do you make the time to volunteer as a th uh, with 3GNY and as a 3G? To me, it, it's just so important to share these stories. Um, personally, this gave me a push to dig into my grandfather's story and now my grandmother's story. It was something, again, I always knew as a child. I always knew my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, but... I was scared. Um, I didn't really want to dig into it. So, it, you know, this organization really gave me a push to listen to their stories and learn. And then why I go into schools is because I, I want these kids to hear these stories. Like I keep saying, some of the students have never heard about the Holocaust. And if they've heard about the Holocaust, they've never heard a survivor. I include the video and the audio because I want them to hear it from the survivor's mouth and to really understand that these were people and these were people not that long ago, you know, our grandparents, um, some of the students, it seems when I talk to them tend to think that this happened a couple, you know, a couple hundred years ago, it was ancient history, but it's not, it's my grandfather, as you can see in the photos, um, I was there with him. And I think that's why I'm involved and just keep sharing these stories because the 
survivors will not be around forever. One question that relates to Judaism today and anti-Semitism is that with the raging rise of anti-Semitism, do you have you ever felt afraid of people knowing that you're Jewish? I haven't. Um, I'm fortunate. I I in the communities I've lived in, I I have not. Um, but it's definitely something I'm cautious of and I'm aware of my surroundings. Um, but I have not really been fearful or in any situations, thankfully. Throughout your life, was your grandfather close with his surviving brother? And did you get to learn about his story over time? And alongside that, did your grandfather associate, besides your grandmother, with other survivors? Yes. Um, most of my grandfather's community was survivors. Um, when he first came to the United States and settled in New Jersey and New York, I think he probably exclusively only spoke with survivors. Again, it was the shared language. He didn't really know English. He was uncomfortable here. So he spoke Yiddish um, with other survivors. And then as he moved um, to other communities, I think he definitely gravitated towards survivors. And yes, he was very close with his brothers. Um, one brother, Max, the one who had survived Dachau, passed away before I was born, but I know they were very close. They all worked in the factory together and lived nearby. Um, and his other brother, Henry, the one who had fled Poland, he was part of our lives up until his death. He actually moved to Boston as well with my grandfather. They lived together um, until the end of their lives. So he was my uncle, Henry, and I got to spend a lot of time with him as well. Um, and they were really close, the three of them. Family was very, as I keep saying, especially my grandfather, family was very important. Aside from luck and hard work, do you think your grandfather would attribute anything else to his survival? He says luck. Um, not that I can think of. I mean, I know what I think maybe added to it. Um, as you said, I think his you know, perseverance and his strength and his positive outlook um, to just live for one day more helped him survive, but he kept saying it was only luck. Did your grandfather's experience during the Holocaust affect his views of the United States in terms of politics or Israeli politics, or did he share that with you? He didn't really share that with me. I was younger. Um, you know, he passed away when I was in my early 20s, and I'm sure it did, but we never had those conversations. Um, he definitely followed closely um, the news in Israel. He loved Israel. He, you know, visited numerous times. We have family there that we're still very much in touch with. Um, so I'm sure he followed political and current events, but we never discussed it. And one final wrap up question. How do you think your grandfather would react or what would he say if he knew that you did this event tonight? I think he'd be really proud. Um, as I said, his family, especially his grandchildren, were the light of his life. And he always supported us and um, wanted to push us to be our best. And I think he would be really proud that I took the time to learn his story, to listen to his recordings. I think that's why he recorded his testimony was so one day we, when we were ready and older, I don't think he wanted us to listen when we were younger, but I think he knew that one day when we were older, it would be important to listen to. Um, so I think he'd be really proud and happy to, to know that I'm doing this. Bella, thank you again for speaking tonight and for sharing your grandfather's story. We're so grateful to have you involved with 3GNY. And thank you so much to Lauren for being a very important part of this program. Thank you again to all of you for joining us this evening. We're glad you took the time to hear Bella speak words that must never be forgotten. If you haven't yet made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope you'll consider making one now. Please refer to the chat for ways you can donate. Thank you.
Also, if you have connections with educators who may want our speakers to present to their classes, please let us know. We have a large speakers bureau of hundreds of grandchildren prepared and ready to present, just like you saw Bella do this evening. We'll send out an email with information on upcoming events, as well as a recording of tonight's program. You can also check out our past We Do Wednesday speakers and other events on 3GNY's YouTube channel. Thanks again for taking the time out of your evening to be with us. We are grateful as always for your presence and support. Have a good evening.